Friends devastated, wondering what they could have done to prevent it. But there is hope for healing and peace. We'll talk about it with the experts and take your questions next on Finding Hope, Confronting the Suicide Epidemic Town Hall. Thank you to the Eunice Joyce Gardner Charitable Foundation for its leadership support of the Health Channel. Welcome to Finding Hope, Confronting the Suicide Epidemic. I'm Olga Villaverde. Suicide deaths are at an all-time high, and some data suggests it is more common today than any time since World War II. And it's not only happening in this country. Take a look at this. Worldwide, more than 700,000 people die by suicide every year. Here at home, nearly 50,000 people died last year. And in 2021, almost 2 million adults attempted suicide. So that brings us to our first video. It's the trailer for a very special documentary called My Ascension, featuring Emma Benoit, who attempted suicide when she was 16 years old. Take a look. If Emma Benoit is gone, then no one has to worry about her anymore. She's gone, and that's it. Now my mom was there. Oh my God! One of my daughter's son is down. Is she breathing? Yes, baby, she's breathing. Stay with me, baby girl, please. I want you to stay now. Every single time she takes a breath in. Now. 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 I didn't have a clue she was struggling. You start thinking immediately, where did I go wrong? Cheerleader, great grades in school, popular. Not Emma. For as long as I can remember, I have struggled with anxiety and depression. And, well, it's the first time I've ever admitted that. A local teen who lived to talk about her suicide attempt is sharing her story with the world. Young people don't want to die. They want their pain to go away. Your story will say to someone out there thinking about death, maybe I need to pause. They said, I may walk or I may not. There's a 1% chance that I will. I don't know if I want to put it out there for the world to see what I really have been through and what I'm going through. I was just having so much suicidal thoughts, I would cry every day. I'm sure you understand. Yeah, I did. <laughs> and you can't help but think, why? Why was I safe, but he wasn't? Your pain was gone, but ours just began. We're drowning out here. We need a lifeguard to send out a raft and pull us ashore. It's so necessary that people understand how you're feeling. Maybe this is my calling. Maybe my pain and suffering can help someone else. I have this weird feeling. It's called hope. If it saves at least one person, then it's worth it. And I am so happy to let you know that Emma is here with us to talk about her mission. She now works with families, schools, and organizations all over the country using her experience to help others. Emma, thank you so much for being with me and for being here with us today. Thank you for having me, it's such an honor. No, the honor is ours. We have so much to get to. I also want to introduce the rest of our panel. Dr. Lori Sutton is a U.S. Army retired Brigadier General and a psychiatrist. Welcome, doctor. And also joining us, Miranda Kahn. She is a television host and a board member for the Southeast Florida chapter of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Again, a very difficult topic to discuss, but I believe one that is necessary. And I want to thank you all for being here with us. Emma, I want to start with you. First of all, for your courage, for being here, thank you. Could you share your personal story? We just saw a little bit on it right now in that very special video, My Ascension. So when I was 12, I really began noticing struggles with navigating life's challenges. And what I really feel 
led to my suicide attempt at 16 years old was the inability and unawareness of how to cope and navigate life struggles that are inevitable. I began struggling with anxiety, like I said, when I was 12, and those struggles never really went away. They just gradually grew as I grew up. And like I said, not having the tools or the skills or really just the knowledge on how to better navigate these difficult conversations and difficult experiences that, like I said, humans will inevitably face, I felt like I was unequipped and I began to feel hopeless. And so those struggles that I carried with me from elementary school all the way to high school um, were never addressed. Those feelings were always suppressed. And I really dealt with the feeling of shame around my emotional distress due to the stigma that was mental and emotional pain. Thank you, Emma. And you know, Miranda, you and I have talked about that stigma. Mm -hmm. uh, you lost your sister, mm -hmm. and I'm so sorry. Thank you. First of all, can you share your sure. story? Yeah, uh, so I lost my sister to suicide in May of 2016. I'm so sorry. Thank you, thank you. Uh, but it's, you know, feeling like hearing Emma's story, uh, this is one of the things that I wanna do. I wanna be an advocate, and I feel like, like Emma was saying, that this is kind of, maybe this is my calling so I can share what happened to my sister in hopes that it doesn't happen to someone else. Uh, but I didn't know right away that she died by suicide. Uh, it's devastating, obviously. It's the hardest thing I've ever been through in my life. Uh, but it's also a privilege because I can be here and share her story and hopefully save other people's lives. Yeah. Miranda, what helped you get through that mm. in your life? Mm. Really good friends. Uh, really good friends. Uh, I had a, a boss that I worked with who had been through a similar experience, uh, who was now a dear friend of mine, uh, really reach out to me and empathize with my situation and direct me to counseling because a lot of people think they don't need counseling and I'll admit it to all of you at home, I was that person. I didn't think I needed it and that helped and I consistently went for several months and I also got involved with my church as well. Um, so it doesn't stop. You still have triggers, you still need to go. And I think that stigma of like, oh, only crazy people do that. That needs to go away. We all need to take care of our mental health. That's right. And because we all mm -hmm. are getting involved, and before we go more into this program, I do want to remind our viewers, we do have a very special number that I would love anyone to jot down. It's only three little numbers. It's so easy. It's 988. That's the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. I can tell you that as soon as you call, in case you're wondering, there is someone there on the other line who wants to help. We're going to be showing that number throughout the hour, but again, all you have to do is dial 988. And for those of you who wonder what happens when you call, we actually have a video for you. So take a look at this. Yeah, yeah, hello. I'm I'm really not sure if this is what you all do, but I, I really don't have anywhere else to turn. Hi. I don't even know why I'm calling right now. I'm sorry. Um, my thoughts are going a mile a minute. My kids are out of state. My, my buddies from the army are all gone now. I'm really alone. I left the service last year. My mom just passed away a few months ago. I miss so much time with her. I keep getting calls about the bills, and I'm trying to get a job, but I feel so stuck. Okay, ma'am, I'm glad you called. Okay, sir, let's stay on the line and walk through some things. Thanks. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Obviously, that is so important for our mm -hmm. viewers to see. Miranda, and I actually wanna ask Emma the same thing, but sure. I'm gonna start with you. Warning signs. Are there mm. any? Were there any? Of course there are. Of course there are. Just like we know a heart attack, a stroke. But real quickly, because you showed that video, and I'm so glad you're getting the hotline out there. I actually took a training class 
which is the same training that those operators that you're hearing on the other line that they take as well. And it's called assist training. And that's available to anybody that wants to take it. So I just want to get that out there. But of course, there are warning signs. I just don't think we're familiar with it, right? Like if we talk about a stroke, look for this heart attack, look for that. Uh, but but there are mood changes. Uh, and Emma, I'm sure you, you can recognize some of these as I'm saying them, but mood changes, sleeping habits, are you withdrawn? Do you see, and I see you nodding your head. Yeah, these are all telltale signs. Sometimes if someone's kind of more, let's say, reclusive, um, maybe they're quiet and all of a sudden they're out there wanting to be with everybody, that can actually be a warning sign as well. So it's important that we pay attention to those substance abuse. Mm -hmm. There are a lot, yeah. Mm -hmm. Emma. Let me bring you in, and now that I'm listening to Miranda, were you experiencing signs that you noticed that maybe others weren't recognizing, that maybe now you can help others by saying, hey, if you see this, pay attention? Absolutely, and my warning signs were kind of masking and mimicking that of what is known as typical teenage behavior. Mm -hmm. And so that is kind of where the danger zone that I kind of fell into was. And in essence, my warning signs were isolation. I was gathering a very low tolerance for frustration. I would be set off at the smallest thing, I would get triggered. Um, and I actually lost the passion for my sport completely. And I decided not to try out for my passion my senior year. And so getting rid of things that I was passionate about, um, being very reactive and being very defensive and in essence, just kind of becoming this different person. My character had gradually changed within the months leading up to my attempt. Mm -hmm. And I think what the issue was in my story was the fact that, like I said, a lot of those warning signs were your typical teenage behaviors. So it was kind of hard for people to identify them. But now knowing what we know, certainly those warning signs were present. And Dr. Sutton, hard for people to identify, but when they do, what should they do, doctor? Well, first of all, let me just say what an honor it is to be with you this evening. Emma, thank you. And Miranda, thank you for sharing your stories and for being here. There's nothing more important than first account uh, stories of what's happened in your own life. And I think, you know, what to do when someone that you care about, someone that you're around that perhaps uh, is exhibiting some of those warning signs that have already been mentioned. And I think the changes in how people talk, the changes in their interests, like Emma mentioned, uh, her, her, uh, you know, her isolation, um, changes in behavior, changes in mood, uh, it's 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 important to you know talk with someone that you care about. Sometimes there's there's this notion that if I bring up you know I'm worried about you know are you so down right now? Are you so um, upset that you might even consider killing yourself? They think that maybe somehow that puts the idea into someone's mind. Actually, the research shows it's just the opposite. Yes. That actually to say the word to bring it up to for example mm. some of you may be familiar with the the uh, columbia protocol they have a uh, all kinds of um, materials this happens to be a a clipboard but even to ask there's only six questions mm -hmm. but this is an evidence-based tool that can really help an individual working with someone that they they love and care about to see that they're not the only ones if, if there's a clipboard, if there's a protocol, that means that a lot of other people have had these kinds of uh, feelings, like have you wished you were dead or wished you could go to sleep and not wake up? Have you actually had any thoughts of killing yourself? That's a, that's a, those are both low risk questions, but then it gets onto the moderate and high risk. Here, you know, have you been thinking about how would you do this? How would you actually take action? Have you had these thoughts and had some intention? So not just thinking about it, but actually intention. And then have you started to work out the details of such a plan? And finally, the, the, the last of the six questions, have you ever done anything, started to do anything, or prepared to do anything to end your life? And if, if, if your loved one, someone near to you, answers yes on those high-risk questions, you can know 
that they are at imminent risk. And that's the time to, to accompany them, uh, if you can, to get help. Maybe it's to their primary care physician. Maybe it's to the local NAMI office. Maybe it's going on a, uh, an AFSP, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, a walk, a community walk. But if someone answers yes to those high-risk questions, and again, I, I recommend you can just look it up, uh, Columbia Protocol, it's the Columbia Severity Rating Scale, the Lighthouse Project, it's a wonderful tool that can really start that conversation that can make all the difference. Absolutely, Dr. Sutton. I'm so glad you brought that up because you and I were actually mm -hmm. talking about this before we started our town hall, and Miranda had actually expressed to me about the stigma. So mm -hmm. I want to bring that up with you, Miranda. Sure. The stigma of not wanting to talk about it, not saying the word. The word. The word. So Suicide. So important to say it. Yeah, uh, in fact, going back to, to what she was just pointing about, those questions, actually saying just the word, are you thinking about right. suicide is actually even more impactful than even saying something, have you thought about killing yourself? There's something about that word that will trigger someone to go, okay, maybe I had. And then working out a plan, again, going back to what those 988 operators, their training is to ask you those questions. How are you feeling? To find those turning points. That turning point, what that means is finding something that you do want to live for and then helping you work out a plan. But the best thing that you can do is be there for people. When Emma talks about those signs of being withdrawn and not wanting to do a sport that she loved, those are signs. That's not normal teenage behavior. And so you can say, hey, you're not acting like yourself. What's going on here? Right. And when they talk about their emotions, so you're feeling anxiety, you're feeling depression. Okay, let me ask you, have you thought about suicide? That word, I mean, I'm just curious, Emma. I think that word, you might have had an answer then. Absolutely. And you know what? It's so relieving to hear us having this kind of discussion in regards to how we're going to address when people are struggling and we notice their behaviors are changing. Had someone approached me and blatantly asked me those open-ended questions, right? And asked me point blank, have you had thoughts of hurting yourself? Have you had thoughts of suicide? It would have been such a relieving question to hear. It would have given me the green light to finally open up and be truthful and vulnerable with someone for honestly the first time ever. My issue was that I felt so alone and I felt so isolated in the ways that I was feeling, mainly because, well, our society doesn't really have these conversations. We like to pretend like someone struggling is over-exaggerating or looking for attention and that's just it. Maybe they are looking for attention. Maybe they need your attention. And so had someone approached me and looked at my struggles as pretty normal human struggles and just addressed the reality that humans face and asked me that question, I really believe that I would have felt so freeing. And I felt, I believe that I would have felt like a weight was lifted off of my shoulders. Mm -hmm. And it would have given me, like I said, that grief to really get into the truth about the way that I was feeling with someone. So important. Thank you so much, ladies. Mm -hmm. You know, suicide can have a tremendous effect on families, all families. For that reason, we're going to be showing videos from the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention throughout the show. They focus on family members and helping them with the loss. Here's one from a son who lost his mother. Take a look. Mm -hmm. When my mother first died, I felt like half of the DNA got ripped out of my body. And I was able to say that at that time. And it sounds so dramatic, um, but I can't imagine anything. Of course it's dramatic. Losing to somebody to suicide is traumatic. And in the first several years of her passing, um, there wasn't making sense of the world. Like the world was completely senseless for, for a long time. Um, and there was a lot of intense emotion all the time. Uh, the intensity certainly changes. Uh, the loss doesn't. I still get really sad. Um, I don't get as sad. I'm not that sad all the time. I'm not that angry all the time. Uh, 
uh, and the intensity doesn't go to the same place. Uh, some of that is time, some of that is how you make sense out of the world, some of that is hearing thousands of survivor stories. Just getting to that place of saying, it happened. Um, and um, my life with a living mother is over, but my life with my mother isn't over. She's still very much a part of me, and my life isn't over. So we just heard about a son who lost his mother. Now we want to hear from a parent who lost their child. Take a look. Dealing with grief has been an, an interesting journey for me from prior to my daughter's death to now, going through observing other people's grief and then when I dropped into the seat of it, going like, oh, now we're arm in arm with this. And it feels like a lighter burden to carry now, but you know, there are moments, um, like the anniversaries. I always tell people, like, plan. Her birthday was International Women's Day, March 8th, so I always do something for March 8th. And that's still a fun, fun day for me. I have fun memories of that day. But when it comes to the anniversary of her death, um, I almost have to take the whole month off. I don't do as much. There's some sort of brain fog that reoccurs, um, like muscle memory in the body going like, oh, okay, we're gonna go through this again. And so now I plan for it. I've gotten good at um, um, creating a policy for myself. So all right, we don't work on this day. Uh, we don't try to, we don't try to adult. We don't try to people. I think it was a big mountain, like this Hercule, Herculean task of carrying this big rock on my back. And now it's like, it's there. And what I've said to people, I said, okay, I don't know that the grief has gotten smaller, but that I've, got, I've gotten stronger. We so appreciate their stories and as a mother I hear this and my heart breaks but then I get a message from Pamela on Facebook and Miranda I want to read mm. it to you. Sure. I've lost two family members to suicide mm. and just did the AFSP walk this past Sunday in their yes. memory. Thank you for this live and bringing awareness. Mm. praying for those who are struggling. Pamela, thank you so much. Yes. A lot of people may wonder why this sadness, why are we talking about it? Because it is so necessary, Miranda, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, well, I mean, more people die from suicide than in natural disasters, war and murder combined. And yet we can barely utter the word suicide. So it's important that we talk about it. And that's why I'm so honored to be here and that we're doing this. And yes, Pamela, thank you. And I'm sorry for your loss, but I'm glad that you did the walk. I've done it too, and it is, there's something powerful about it. So I commend you for it. Emma, I wanna bring you in your thoughts on Pamela and what we just watched. It is truly so inspiring to see people who have lost loved ones have the courage to even share their loved one's story. And I'm always moved when I hear from loved ones and how strong and resilient they have to be in the face of this tragedy. I also think that what they're doing to continue to honor their loved ones serves such a purpose. And I think that the second that we can try and turn our pain into purpose, it is fulfilling and it actually is therapeutic. It's been therapeutic for me mm -hmm. to use my experience and try and help others. And like we've been mentioning this entire conversation thus far, you know, if we talk about this more, if we put this information at the forefront of people's minds, and if we just rally around together as humans in society and acknowledge that brain pain doesn't discriminate, mm -hmm. we are not susceptible to this tragedy. No one is immune to suicide. It is all of our business.
it is all of our priority to be advocates for suicide prevention. It takes a village to raise a child, but I think it takes a community to save one. And so seeing so many people come together, lost survivors, survivors, advocates, professionals, everyone together, we all play a vital part. And so I'm just so grateful to hear from people with lived experience because like it was said before, um, that is where we really can learn. And I think how great can the future of our society be if we just start talking about this on a more open basis, more open dialogue. And Emma, I loved what you said. It takes a community to save one. That was absolutely beautiful. Uh, Dr. Sutton, I got a comment from someone on Facebook and I wanna help her and let's listen to what she wrote. She writes, I attempted suicide. I felt it was my only escape from all the pain I was feeling. I didn't see any other options at the time. I was alone. My family doesn't understand mental illness. I'm not comfortable talking to many people about it and I bottle up. Your words to this individual, Dr. Sutton. Well, first of all, thank you. What, what was her name? I'm sorry, did she? There is uh, no name, it's just a comment. Let's just say, let's just say whoever, whoever this individual is, I just want to really thank this individual for coming forward and being vulnerable and sharing what that is like and feeling like you have nowhere to go. I would say that, um, what this individual is experiencing is real. Um, I would want this individual to know that treatment works. And if she even can just get engaged with the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention in her community or the National Alliance for Mentally Ill, uh, if she has a primary care uh, team that she gets her health care from, if she has a church, I think it was mentioned earlier, uh, Miranda, the, the, the role that faith can play, but to understand that those uh, experiences, the changes in her mood, the changes in her behavior, the changes in her ability to really engage and take action on her own behalf, those are warning signs. And I would mm -hmm. say this as well, you know, Dr. Thomas Joyner, he did some really uh, important groundbreaking work on the reasons people die by suicide. And the, he came to this work as a research psychologist. His father died by suicide in front of him in his kitchen. And he had to reconcile what would make someone that I know loves me so much do this. The three top reasons. One, individuals who die by suicide feel displaced. They feel like they don't belong, like they don't have that purpose that, that Emma talked about. I hear that in this individual's uh, comments. The second is they feel, it's almost like their their thinking is distorted. I call these the three D, so displacement distortion, where even people can get to the point where they feel like, gosh, if, if I died, it would be a gift to my family, it would be a gift to the world. And that really is a, is a, a really a, a sign of, uh, the need for clinical intervention. People who die by suicide, the World Health Organization estimates over 80 to 90% have a diagnosable mental health condition. So it's critical to get that help. And then third, the third D is dissociation. This one's a little trickier uh, because, you know, um, just getting through the day right mm -hmm. now, you know, one has to ask, you know, uh, what am I subjecting myself to? Am I around people who are draining my energy? Am I, work, am I spending way too much time on destructive uh, behaviors or movies or uh, video games, things that really um, blunt or, or, or diminish what I feel, a sense of numbness? But those are all reasons to absolutely connect connect in whatever way this individual has within her community to connect and the two great sources that are available to anyone in this country i mentioned american foundation for suicide prevention and the national alliance for mentally ill right there in mm -hmm. every single community thank you dr sutton thank you so much still getting many comments on facebook and i i i, I want to say thank you to um apostle he is joining us from Alabama. Mm. I have a family member that died by suicide and I mm. miss him so much. 
Apostle, I am so sorry. We're here for you. Pamela on Facebook, thank you so much for this program. I now want to get training to help others in crisis. Fantastic to hear, Pamela. I do have a question from Isaac on YouTube. Emma, I'm going to give this one to you if you don't mind, dear. If you have a friend that shows signs of suicide, is it recommended to approach that friend one on one or can it be a group of friends? Great question from Isaac. Emma? So I think honestly, it depends on your friend, right? So everyone is is uniquely individual. So you know your friend best, right? And so when you want to approach having this conversation with your friend, let's think, is my friend naturally open in group settings or are, there more, are they more open in a one-on-one -on -one basis. So first I would say that is a decision that you can make based on how your friend is in group settings versus one-on-one. -on -one. But generally speaking, I feel personally that I would have preferred if my friends would have approached me one-on-one. -on -one. Mm. Because a lot of times what happens is people that are struggling, when someone reaches their hand in to offer assistance, it can kind of feel like you're being interrogated. And that kind of stems from a place of the stigma. We feel like we have to give them the right answer to make them feel comfortable. And we don't feel like we can really truly be vulnerable with our answers. So it's important that we're setting up an environment with our friend that is safe, non-judgmental, and validating. Mm. So my advice to you would be, if you're going to support that friend, certainly think about how the friend is, group or individual, but I would prefer individual because then you can sit down face to face with your friend and say, hey, I've noticed you've been exhibiting X, Y, and Z behaviors. I'm really worried about you. Is there anything that you wanna to talk to me about? You know, And just have the conversation. My advice would be, like we were mentioning earlier, don't shy away from asking those hard questions. Use the S word, use the word suicide. It's not gonna trigger that thought in them. It's just gonna give them the freedom to express it. So my advice again would be, think about how your friend is, create an environment that is safe and conducive for a vulnerable discussion, validate them, let them know that what they're feeling is real for them, let them know that you are not, that they're not alone, and also ultimately just encourage them to continue talking, continue sharing, because the more that they open up, the less that they will feel so alone, and the more that they'll actually gain the ability to verbalize what they're feeling internally. Um, I hope that advice helps, and oh, please, please don't be afraid to open up that conversation. Like I said, it really will be a weight lifted off of your friend struggling. Such great advice, so powerful. Thank you so much, Emma. Now, while males die by suicide at a much higher rate, the numbers of high school girls who mm -hmm. are at risk is alarming. The pandemic appears to have had a severely negative influence on young women. Take a look at this. According to the CDC Youth Behavior Survey, in 2021, approximately one third of female high school students reported they seriously considered attempting suicide. That's a 24% increase from the year before. One fourth of female students reported making a plan and a little over 13% said they attempted suicide. So Miranda, let me bring you in. I know you do a number of speaking engagements. Mm -hmm. You go around. Do you hear from others the same thing that we're talking about? And these numbers are just alarming to me. Yeah, they're very alarming and they should be rightfully so. I'm so glad you're bringing it up. I mean, Emma was a example of that. She was a teenager. Teenage girls we know uh, suffer from insecurities. And now you have social media. You have the COVID lockdowns. And they were withdrawn. They're looking at social media to validate. I'm using that same word that Emma brought up, validate themselves. Did I get enough likes? Um, they're addicted to it. It actually is shown to increase anxiety, increase depression. They're, they're checking that, and it's a very addictive behavior. I think that has a lot to do with it because make, make no mistake, you've seen an increase in social media interaction, mm -hmm. people using it more. These teenagers using it more, therefore you're also seeing an increase in uh, suicide attempts or suicidal thoughts among teenage girls. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Sutton, I wanna bring you in here because um, social media, you know, Miranda just hit it right now. What it has done to our adolescence, mental health issues have arisen. I know there's not just one cause to all of this, but those two truly play a huge role. No, Olga, thank you so much for bringing this up. It's a vitally important mm -hmm. topic. And let me start with saying that the 
big tech companies bear huge responsibility for this. I just was reading a story this morning about one of the largest tech executives who absolutely dismissed disabling a feature that allows particularly girls using social media apps to uh, change their physical attributes and to uh, alter their appearance and said, no, I'm not going to disable that. Uh, there's no evidence that that's, that's, a, that's having any harmful effect. Well, look at those figures that you just share. Exactly. Secondly, secondly, the big tech companies are hiring some of the most well-trained, well-educated neuroscientists who know exactly what kinds of behaviors, whether it's the ease of retweeting, whether it's those kinds of uh, features that allow you to distort and alter your image, whether it's the likes, as you already mentioned, those with every little like that you press, a little squirt of dopamine in your brain that becomes reinforced, it becomes an addictive behavior and it becomes devastating then over time. So what's helping here? I would point everyone's attention to Surgeon General Vivek Murthy, he has declared an epidemic of loneliness and social isolation in our country, mm -hmm. and he has a particular focus on what uh, the mental health of our youth and with a particular focus even more so just on this issue with young girls, such as Emma, who was isolated, felt alone, didn't feel like she could possibly share what was going on, and now she's got the most sage advice for her peers, and for all of us to learn and heed from. And Emma, I see you nodding. I want your thoughts on this because I think this hits home. You were 16 years old. So tell me your thoughts right now. Oh boy, where to begin with social media? I totally agree with everything that was stated about social media. For me, the biggest issue when it came to social media was that I was literally forming a self-identity and self-worth based on the internet. And I believe that it is so toxic, especially for young girls because of the, the uh, influencer beauty standard and culture that we are now supposedly supposed to be living by. Um, perfectionism is running rampant um, amongst teenagers, especially teenage girls. And the thought and idea that a person's two minute story clip of them living their best life is their entire life. And I believe that it's truly distorting our youth's perception of reality. It is totally coming in and infiltrating everything that they believe about themselves and putting it into a totally different realm when they're thinking of the way that they look and the way that they are supposed to look. And so I feel that social media is dangerous for a number of reasons, but the two Biggest reasons why it was harmful for me was the comparison element. So I mentioned, right, like how much access we have to other people's lives, going on Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, looking at a person's, you know, 1.1% of their life um, and not really understanding that they live an entire life outside of what they choose to post. So it's really distorting their realities. They are comparing themselves to others. And ultimately, it's just creating a generation where we feel that like I said, there's a certain standard of perfection to live up to, and it's unattainable. We all know that perfectionism is not realistic and it is unattainable, but the harmful thing about social media is that it's actually making people believe the opposite to be true. So now you have girls trying to create a social media worthy lifestyle, trying to have everything that their quote, uh, favorite influencers have to then get value and validation and self-worth from. So it really is super dangerous for the subconscious development of our youth and the overall perception of reality that is unfortunately being so distorted on those platforms. Emma, so it's really harmful all, all together. You are unbelievable. And I'm just so proud to have you here on our show today. Thank you so much for those words. I don't think anyone could have said it more perfect. Moving on now, we honor our veterans for their service and rightfully so. But according to the Veterans Administration, about 17 veterans die by suicide every day and many more attempt it. Our friend and colleague Montel Williams thought about taking his own life after being diagnosed with a serious illness. Here's what he told us on an earlier town hall. Listen. 
you know, you feel like you're spiraling, you're spiraling out of control and spiraling into the depths of depression by yourself, not recognizing that there are others out there and there's other ways to help yourself. There's ways to get help. So one of the things that I did, um, fortunately and blessedly, you know, I, I took the second to recognize the damage my loss would be to my family. The pain was really excruciating today, but guess what? I lived through yesterday and I'm living through today. So I'll live through tomorrow. It's not a matter of ending it all. It's a matter of beginning again. And that's what we got to be truly impressed upon people. And help is out there. Dr. Sutton, you and I were on that town hall when Montel spoke to us. He is a dear friend of mine. And I remembered how much he spoke about family and family and how family got him through this and how important that was for him. And these veterans that have different risk factors than other people as well. Well, such powerful words, and um, Montel just has a way of, much like Emma, much like Miranda, just speaking from the heart, first hand personal experience. There's nothing that duplicates it. And I think that a couple of things strike me here. One, uh, fortunately, Montel had a strong family. Not all of us are so lucky. And when it comes to whether it's members of the LGBTQ plus community who have struggled mightily, both in the military as well as out of the military, yes, things are much better now, now that we're past don't ask, don't tell, but the suicide rate is much higher within the gay community, within the veteran community, as you mentioned, 57% increase you're 57% more likely as a veteran to die by suicide than your age-matched non-veteran peer. That doesn't even, um, that's just not acceptable. And what are the risk factors in particular that veterans face? Well, one, uh, they have a higher trauma load. There's a higher rate of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder among veterans. We need to absolutely work like fury to update and advance breakthrough treatments for PTSD, and they are out there. Secondly, the loss of structure and purpose and social support when you move from being a member of the military to then becoming a veteran is enormous. Veterans, the, the, the number one uh, most underrated asset in the VA system is the vet center itself. It's a storefront place where people can come over and get a cup of coffee, but there are trained professionals to work with you and your family to work through what's going on and to connect you to the larger VA medical center when, when appropriate. But I think that, you know, the, the hope that I have in this moment, because as has been said, we are all in this together. Mm -hmm. When I was in the military for 30 years, the rate of suicide advanced from having been well less than the general population, age match peers, because after all, veterans are a selected population. And so their rate for many years was lower than their age match peers. But around 2009, 2000, that changed. And the 17 per day that you mentioned, it's actually much, much higher when you include substance use disorders and overdose and addiction. And so the, the, the challenge now is for all of us to understand that, you know, as bad as it's been with veterans and as much as work as we have to do with our fellow brothers and sisters in arms, all of us as a society, we have increased suicides uh -huh. 30% yes, since uh -huh. 2000 in this century. That is a trauma tsunami. And so we must all, rather than, dis di than, than dividing ourselves into different tribes, different groups, we must all come together and understand that this human condition that's so often accompanied with depression, anxiety, substance use, trauma, uh, the insecurity that comes from, as Emma just mentioned, just growing up as a teen and trying mm -hmm. to figure out where do I fit in? How, how do I develop? coping skills when everything I see on social media looks like people are having these perfect lives. And it starts with talking about it. Absolutely. Speaking the truth. We can be real with each other, human to human. And that's the first step 
to us getting from where we are now to where we want and need to be. Thank you, Dr. Sutton. Thank you so much for your passion and for your words. Losing a child is devastating for any parent. Here's how one mother learned to cope with her loss. Take a look. Through the five years for now that I'm moving through this journey, um, what, a couple of things that I've learned, what, um, one in particular is I really had to question spirituality. Um, I had to question what is death? Um, where is Pierce? I felt as though death was, it was over, life was over, but what I realize now is I can still have a relationship with him. I can still talk to him. I can still think about him. I can think about what he would do, what he would say. Um, I can still express my love to him. I feel like it, it's the same as talking about my living children and what they're doing. I have two, I have two daughters. They do X, X, and X, and I have a son. He died by suicide. That is part of his story. Um, I don't feel any shame around it or, um, or fear to make someone else feel uncomfortable. I don't worry about what other people think anymore. What a powerful story. I have a question from Chris that I'm going to get to in just a moment. But Miranda, after seeing that video, mm -hmm. how, I want to ask you, how did you cope with the loss of your sister? How did you get through it? Mm. Well, I would say that I'm still going through it. Unlike, you know, loss is loss, but what's different about suicide, and, and I'm sure Emma and the doctor, you, you would agree with this, is there's, there's a guilt to it. There's a shame to it. Um, and, and when I found out I lost my sister to suicide, I immediately, well, I collapsed. And it took me months, it took me two years to even admit that she died by suicide and I blamed myself every minute of the day. So that was the hardest thing. But I also realized, and again, this is through faith, that that was prideful of me to think that, that it was all about me. A lot of people, and then I think I heard that in your documentary, they do this because they feel like everybody would be better off if they're gone, you know? But, but I, you know, we're doing something now, just like you are, Emma, just like you are, doctor. We're doing something now, we're being proactive. And one of the things that I did, like you're doing a documentary, Emma, is I finished my sister's children's book. And I'm using it as a catalyst to talk about suicide prevention. And I'm hoping it will continue, and my goal, is to get it in every school I can and every church I can. So everyone is having this conversation like we're having today. So. And Emma, you know, chiming on what Miranda said, you know, she's, she's writing a children's book and I actually want to show it to our viewers. Sure. So I'm going to take the you. time real quick to show how beautiful these books are that Miranda is doing for her sister. Blue Discovers Floral Land. I love that. And The Blossoms of Floral Land. God yeah. bless you, Miranda. Emma, I want to talk you. about just holding on to memories, when to start talking, how to do it. Chris is asking this question, and I think you can help him. When is the best time after a loss of suicide within a high school to approach the subject and use that as a platform to educate others? This was a recent event locally and administration was hesitant to take on the topic. What would you say? We're talking about it, Miranda, you, mm -hmm. Dr. Sutton, what would you say to Chris? Well, I would say as soon as you can possibly talk about it is the place to start. I think sitting on the issue, assuming that people are gonna go through their own grieving process is really ludicrous, a ludicrous approach to confronting the loss by suicide. I think being proactive is obviously this place we wanna start, right? Versus being reactive. But when we lose someone to suicide, it's so necessary, especially within a school, to talk about it, to honor the student, use their name, discuss this issue, 
Because what you don't want to have happen is students are grieving the loss of their friend and then they get resentful to their school for never addressing it. I've seen countless schools, unfortunately, go through this where they lose a student and they don't want to move on it. They don't want to address it. They want to kind of just brush it under the rug and pretend like it didn't happen. And what, what ultimately ends up happening is more kids then struggle and more kids then learn to suppress those feelings. And in turn, it just creates a mm -hmm. negative ripple effect as opposed to addressing the issue head on, discussing the loss in very real terminology with the students and acknowledging that, yes, this is an issue. Yes, our school is aware of this issue. And here's where you come for support. Here's where you go if you're struggling. Here are ways to cope with these types of loss. Here are ways to communicate these feelings with your peers. And opening up that dialogue can only encourage schools to really be proactive in the face of tragedy. So I would say as soon as you possibly can, don't be afraid to discuss it. Um, and I did wanna mention on the face of the discussion of loss, I think it can be really challenging for someone who loses someone to suicide to put aside that guilt. And I'm so proud of you, Miranda, for being able to put that guilt aside because from a perspective of someone who has been there actively suicidal and had an attempt, I never wanted to ever hurt my loved ones. That was never in my intentions. And I know that everyone that died by suicide, they never meant to hurt you. They never meant to do it for you to take personally. It is such a deep and complex issue. And when you're dealing with the brain, there are so many things that can go wrong. My brain was lying to me. I was believing that I was a burden. And so I just wanna put that out there. If you have lost someone, please know that it wasn't your fault. You did not do anything that triggered that person to make that decision. It was a perfect storm. Please, please remove the guilt. It's not your fault. And I know that if they were here today, they would agree with me on that. I see the emotion. God bless you. I see the emotion in your eyes. Ah, ah, God bless you, Emma. Um, that just that just made my whole night um, hearing you say that. But going back, I, I want to touch on something real quickly. The question that you raised about schools and when's the time to act. Emma, and I'm curious, and Dr. Sutton, you would probably know this too, but my other concern is waiting on that, that it could lead to more suicides. Because that can happen. You can have a ripple effect where someone takes his or her life and mm -hmm. then other teenagers may go, well, maybe I should do that. Or maybe it was my fault and they may try to do that. I, I mean, I'm just curious. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you yeah. so much. I do want to show one more video before Enwood our uh, town hall, but I also want to get a comment in from Michelle. She says, thank you for this live talk. I'm a teacher and suicide mm -hmm. is becoming more prevalent among younger and younger kids. Yes, you're absolutely right, Michelle, and that's why we're talking about this. So conversations about suicide can make a difference as we are seeing here today in helping not only with grief, grief but also when someone is at risk. Take a look at this video. That's the ketchup? No. Dad, are you okay? Uh, yeah, just stressed out. Oh, and the melody is sounding so much better. I can play it for you. Wait, where's your guitar? I uh, gave it to your cousin. What? That guitar's like your favorite thing. I don't need it anymore. Some days are just better than others. I think you should go talk to someone. It's not that easy. Have you been thinking about suicide? You can talk to me, Dad. Such a powerful video. Comment from Diane, which I'd like to share. I'm a mental health professional. I'm here because I'm continually open to learning and cultivating further understanding. Those, those of us providing care run for higher risk of compassion, fatigue, and burnout. Thank you so much for that comment. Dr. Sutton, I only have about 30 seconds, but I wanna get final thoughts from you and everyone. I'm gonna start with you, please. Heartfelt gratitude to everyone who has shown up tonight. One thing that I didn't mention is just to highlight what's on the screen. 988, a lot of folks worked hard for years to get a simple 
suicide prevention helpline. You can call it with your friend like Emma talked about, Miranda has spoken about the importance of talking and we're here today showing up. And, and let's agree, this is the beginning of an ongoing Absolutely. dialogue, not the end. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Miranda, you're yes. holding the books. Tell me yes. a little bit about the books and your final thoughts. Final thoughts, uh, Blossoms of Floorland. It was a you know project that my sister started and I finished it. And again, like I said, I'm using it as a catalyst to draw attention to suicide and to give a voice to the voiceless. And you can learn more by going to Blossoms of Floorland. Thank you so much. Com. Thank you mm -hmm. for being here. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story. Honor. Of course, Emma, I have to end with you. First of all, how is Emma today? Oh, I'm doing so wonderful. Yes, I have you are. such a new perspective on life and I am truly so blessed not only to have a lease at life, but also to be using my experience to try and help others by raising awareness, spreading hope and advocating for suicide prevention. So it's my mission now to raise mental health awareness so that other people know that they are never alone. And like I said, I use my voice and my story to help advocate for suicide prevention so that others know that suicide does not need to be the option and hope is a very real thing. So thank you all for choosing to be here tonight. It means the world to me and thank I'm sure you, to many others who have struggled with suicide and suicide loss. So thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you so much. God bless mm -hmm. you, Emma. Your future is bright. You are beautiful and we thank you for your story. I wanna thank everyone who's watched tonight, everyone who has sent in comments and don't forget that suicide and cri crisis lifeline number, dial 988. And remember, you are never, ever alone. Take care. Thank you to the Eunice Joyce Gardner Charitable Foundation for its leadership support of the Health Channel.